So I was reading an article online call, uh, called uh, 17 Unusual Things About Forgiveness. And some of these things were like no does. Like children tend to forgive others easier than adults. Or how about this one? We don't believe the apologies of public figures. Okay, so, so we get that, right? So, but here's one that really caught my attention. And, it, and it, it's so weird. It's like this. Dogs forgive their owners. Cats never do. <laughs> really, it said... There's animals like dogs and goats and monkeys. I don't know why goats. I mean, and they tend to forgive the other animals around them, but cats never do. So I can lock my dog in the garage overnight, and when he sees me, he's super thrilled in the morning, but my cat wants to scratch my eyes out. Okay, so here's the thing. Don't be a cat. <laughs> Learn to forgive other people, right? right? C.S. Lewis once remarked and quipped about forgiveness. He says, Forgiveness is a lovely idea until you have to forgive somebody for something they did to you. Then it's not so appealing, this whole forgiveness thing. So we're in this teaching series about a man named Joseph, and his brothers mistreat him. And we're coming to a point in the story, as we've been in this teaching series, we're coming to a point that there's going to be some conversations between him and his brothers who sold him into slavery and his brothers tried to kill him. So there's going to be some forgiveness going on. And that's what we're going to look at today. So let me get you up to speed on the big story of Joseph. So Joseph is one of 12 brothers. The dad's name is Jacob. We get the 12 tribes of Israel from those 12 brothers. May the light bulb will come on for you that way. And uh, Joseph's dad has four wives, very dysfunctional home. His brother is Benjamin uh, by the same mother. Then he's got all these other step or uh, half brothers. Well, one day his dad, Jacob, gives him a brand spanking new Ferrari. Okay, it's a coat of many colors, but he gets a nice gift. And the other brothers get a moped. Okay, that's what, they get nothing, right? And it creates jealousy. Jealousy in the family. And the Bible says that these brothers hated Joseph. In fact, several times it said they hated him all the more. So one day Joseph was uh, with them and they threw him down into a pit. And pits were common there to collect water. And they threw him down about 20 feet. And they were going to murder him. So we're, we're talking serious stuff here, right? They're going to murder him. And right about this time, some, some uh, people come by traveling to Egypt and they sell him to those folks. They're called Midianites. And then they take him to Egypt. So Joseph, 17 at this time, and ends up in a man's house named Potiphar, a high-ranking official. And he moves up the ladder of servitude and ends up being what we would call in charge of the estate and the plans. And then one day Mrs. Potiphar accuses him of, of, uh, of uh, sexual misconduct, of rape. And Joseph ends up in a political prison. And he spends not a few days in a prison. He spends like 10 years in this prison. And then because Joseph is so talented, he rises up in the prison, becomes kind of a, a person of influence there, and is recognized as a leader, and it becomes known that he can interpret dreams, which dreams were a big deal back then. And what happens is that, that Pharaoh has a dream, the, the head guy of Egypt, and he finds out that Joseph can interpret dreams. So Joseph comes in his presence, he can interpret the dream, and what happens is he elevates Joseph to number two, in charge of all Egypt because the dream was you're going to have seven good years of food and economy and then you're going to tank for seven years. It's going to be a famine. So he puts Joseph in charge, right? In the meantime, Joseph brothers, they're in the land of Canaan, they're starving to death. They don't have any food. And this is going on, and they have to come to Egypt to buy food. And that sets us up for our story, how he's going to have some interaction with his, with his brothers as well. So that, that's kind of where we're going today. And here's what we're going to talk about all morning. Here's what we're going to talk about, this big idea here. And this is it. Our big idea is coming. <laughs> here we go. Make it easy for the other person to forgive themselves. Do you understand that? Make it easy when you forgive somebody. Make it easy for them to forgive themselves. Because the exact opposite can happen. You have somebody that you need to forgive. 
and, but you make it hard for them. You got hoops for them to jump through, and then you want to embarrass them, right, right, right? You just want to, you know, make it difficult. You want to extract something from them. You want the whole world to know they abused you. You want the whole world to know they stole from you. You want everybody to know they were mean to you. And you just want to kind of drive that in to them as well. It's like this. You want to remind your your sibling what they said. You want to remind your spouse every day what they did. You want to remind your coworker that they let you down on that project and they never give up on that. So we're going to look at how Joseph does this forgiveness thing. And I think it's going to be helpful to us today because we can say forgiveness is a great idea, but we have to learn to practice it as well, right? So if you have a Bible or the church app, you can bring up all the notes today and you can follow along with me. But let's pick up this story in Genesis chapter 43, verse 33. And here's the setting. Joseph has held a banquet for these strangers from Canaan. They don't know that Joseph is their brother yet. They think he's just the top dog in Egypt. So here we go. The men have been seated before him in the order of their ages, from the firstborn to the youngest, and they looked at each other in astonishment. When portions were served to them from Joseph's table, Benjamin, that's his youngest brother, portion was five times as much as anyone else's. So they feasted and drank freely with them. So Joseph invites them to his palace. And this is creepy, right? He see, how does he know the order of their birth? You know, they're freaking out. Like, well, one of my neighbors where I grew up, they had 12 kids. And at one time, I knew all 12 of them by name. I even knew the order in which they were born. But you know what? Today, I totally forgot. I can't, I can't even remember. I can't even remember all their names. But here's a stranger that lines them up from the oldest to the youngest. And they give the youngest more steak. He gets the best steak. Okay, he gets a big, thick steak. Everybody else gets a little dinky McDonald's hamburger. Okay, you got, kind of got the story here. This is, this is what's going on. Benjamin gets the biggest. You know what Joseph is doing, by the way? He's seeing if they're going to be jealous of Benjamin, the youngest, like they were jealous of him. He's testing them with that. What's going to happen to Benjamin? So let's pick up the story again in chapter 44, verse 11. Each of them quickly lowered his sack to the ground and opened it. So here's what's happened. They're taking food back home to Canaan after this big feast. But Joseph has put some articles of silver in their bags and accused them of stealing. Then the steward proceeded to search, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. And the silver cup, this priceless thing, was found in Benjamin's sack. And this is where all the brothers are going to go, we're in trouble. It's going to be lights out for us. This guy we just feasted with, he's thinking that we stole this stuff. We didn't steal anything as well. And then the brother Judah speaks up. And he says, in verse 33, he says, Now then, he's talking to Joseph, Please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy. That would be Benjamin. And let the boy return to his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come on my father. And that's where probably Joseph's just like, oh. He needs to see that his brothers have a change of heart. Are they going to ditch Benjamin like they ditched him? And so Judah volunteers to be the one that is punished. And what's so amazing about this is out of all the brothers, Judah's probably the most immoral, the whole bunch. But he's finally having a courageous stand to do something. And then this is how this reconciliation, this forgiveness is going to happen. And if you look at Genesis chapter 45, verse 1, we're going to read a lengthy portion here. I'm going to point some stuff out to you. So get ready. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brother. So this is the big reveal. And in verse 2 it says, And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. 
Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? And I'm guessing all of a sudden he switches from, from the Egyptian language to Hebrew with a perfect dialect, and they're shocked. They're like, what's going on here? I am Joseph, is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, you might underline this, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold to Egypt. I want you to know something. Come close to me. Hey, you sold me. <laughs> Very definite. You sold me into Egypt. And now do not be distressed. And do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing or reaping. In other words, we're going to have such an economic downturn, a depression. It's going to be terrible, and God sent me here so that you could live. Verse 7, but God sent me ahead of you. So Joseph is connecting the details for them. Hey, you may have sold me here, but God wanted me here. Ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Verse 8, so then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now, Hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen. I mean, you're going to have the best spot. And be near to me, you and your children, your grandchildren, your flocks and your herds, all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can't, you can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it really, it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen, and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him and weeping. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And afterwards, afterward, his brothers talked with them. Talked with them. Hey, here's our big idea. Let's skip right so we get it in our heads. Make it easy for the other person to forgive themselves. That, that's what Joseph does in this story. It's, it's kind of like they're all, they all come back for this. They haven't seen each other for 20 years. They have so much to talk about. Have you ever been to one of those family reunions or a wedding? You haven't seen anybody for 10, 15 years and, or something like that. You haven't seen anybody in a long time and you're just catching up. Can you imagine how long they'd have to talk? You were in prison? What was that like? You know, they've got questions of each other and they're discussing those as well. Joseph, though, practiced this, this, this forgiveness. In other words, don't be a cat. Don't be a cat. Now, then Joseph is trying to look at his brothers to say, did they genuinely have a change of heart? Are their hearts different? Or are they still this group of people who threw me into the pit and they want to kill me? Are they th that same group? And he absolutely sees a change. I wrote some of them down in my notes here. I just went, he, they don't resent that Benjamin gets more food than they do at the party. They uh, didn't accuse each other of doing wrong when the silver cup and stuff was in the bags of food. They stuck together with Benjamin. They didn't abandon him as well. They completely humbled themselves before Joseph when they thought he was the prime minister of, of Egypt. And so, they, in fact, they offered themselves to stay as prisoners if they would just send Benjamin back to be with their dad. So all of these things are pointing it up for, for, for um, Joseph that they've had a change of heart. Now, one of the questions I have, and maybe you have too, is why didn't he do this earlier? And why did he drag it out? It's because he needs to test them. He needs to find out exactly what are they thinking? Are they still trying to kill me? You know, what, what's going on here with them? And will they throw Benjamin under the bus? And what's going to happen is... The Jewish people are going to come out of Egypt with 2 million people 
This is 400 years later. Moses will lead them to the promised land. They will have plundered the Egyptians of all their wealth. And God is getting ready to make them into a great nation. But they need to be purified. They need to have their hearts right with God. And that's, that's what the Lord is doing here. He's assembling this great family. One of the questions I just simply have is, man, I can't believe, what are Joseph's options? He could have said to them, you're my brothers. Kill them all. <laughs> right? <laughs> He'd have, or he could have said this, do you remember me? And they would have been shocked. He says, you're going to a prison. It's where I was for 10 years. Or he could have said this to them, ha, huh, remember me? Why don't you just go back with no food and starve to death? Just go back, you're going to die. Now, it would be interesting how many of us would have chosen one of those options, right? Right? And some of you go, oh, I would have forgiven just like Joseph did. Oh, probably not. None of you would have, right? You'd have been mad and bitter and angry. You just said, go back and die. Curl up in a cave and just shrivel away. I'm going to send you to that prison. You want to talk about a tough life? You're going to be there for the rest of your lives. You're going to be stuck. But he doesn't do that. Joseph leads him to the point of confession. And often that's where we need to be because when we do something wrong, sometimes we just dig in our heels. And we don't want to admit reality. I heard a story a long time ago, and it's maybe true. Four college students, they uh, were living in an apartment, and they had a big chemistry test, test the next day. And they decided to go out partying, and then uh, they didn't study. And then they overslept, and they didn't make it to the exam. And so when they realized this, they concoct a story, and they go and tell the professor, hey, we live off campus together, and, and we, uh, we had a flat tire, and we couldn't make it in. We, we couldn't make it. Can we please retake? This is not our fault. We had a flat tire, and the prof, he's like, well, I don't, you know, he's kind of thinking about it quickly on his feet, and he goes, okay, tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., you come to my office, you can take that final exam. So they show up at his office, and he divides them up into four little rooms, and he says, here's your test. He hands out one of those booklets, and there are only two questions on it. And the first one is worth five points, and it's super easy. I mean, it's like super easy chemistry question. What's H on the periodic table? Oh, hydrogen, you know. You just kind of, you know, just, they knew that one. They flipped the page over, and it said, for 95 points, which tire was flat? You know what we do is what, we do something wrong and then we lie about it to cover it up, right? And then we have to lie about the lie to cover up the lie of the lie and then it just spirals out of control, right? That can happen to Joseph's brothers, right? But at that point, they have decided that they're going to, in other words, come clean about things. And that's what we need to do as well. And so I want to point out some principles that Joseph does. I'm going to point out five of them that I think will help other people to forgive themselves. So you want to forgive somebody in such a way that they don't have to wallow in self-pity. They don't have to wallow in misery because that's not forgiveness. When you can forgive someone in such a way that they actually forgive themselves, you have granted somebody freedom. That's what forgiveness is all about. So here's the first one. Do it in private. So when Joseph called his brothers together with him and the Egyptians were there and he can't take it anymore, he's going to tell them that he's Joseph. He sends everybody out of the room. Because here's why. I think he wants, he doesn't want them to know, all the other Egyptians, what they'd done to him. Because he wants the the Egyptians to love and adore his family because he's going to be bringing them home. He doesn't want them to have a bad reputation. He wants to do all of this in private. And what do we do? 
We might say we forgive and then we blast it on social media and we go to Facebook and we say, do you know what they did to us? But good thing I forgave them. We go, to, we go to Twitter, Instagram or whatever and we just send out those grenades and we're just lampooning people. That's not forgiveness. That's retribution. And that's not what Joseph does. Forgiveness does not start on Facebook. Forgiveness does not start on Twitter. Forgiveness starts in your heart. Joseph understands that. He understands that. Joseph is anti-cancel culture because what we want to do is we want to cancel people out on social media and we want to blast them and mar them and make them suffer. That's what we want to do. That's the natural human thing to do. Social media is just gossip central for these things. As well. But he does it privately. He takes care of the situation just in the family. Number two, the second way, make them feel at ease. She knows in the Bible that Joseph says to them, hey, uh, come close to me. I think it's verse four, come close to me. Now, there are a couple ways to do this, come close to me. You can do it this way. You over here. You, talking to you, <laughs> you, and you come over here. Do you remember a teacher or your parent going, and you're like, uh-oh, this is going to be bad. I know that feeling because I've been on the other end of that. <laughs> but how about this? He goes, come close to me. That's different, right? That's different. He said, hey, Let's come on in to the family. The Bible says, Paul says in the New Testament, we don't keep records of wrongdoings. We don't, we don't, in other words, we're not gonna hold it against you anymore. So Joseph, he made them feel comfortable, made them feel at ease, and he's having dinner with them. And you know, when you eat with somebody, people let their guards down, right? You just make them feel at ease. That's, that's what he's doing with his family. Here's the third thing I think he does, and it's really helpful. He reduces their feelings of self-hatred, and he says, he says in the text, he says, I don't want you to feel distressed. In other words, somebody can do something wrong, their attitude or action is wrong, and we can make them feel even worse about it, even though they're trying to seek forgiveness. And we just want to keep them under our thumb, and what we're doing is, we're just enabling them to hate themselves on the inside. And Joseph doesn't want to do that. He says, don't be distressed. He's reassuring them. He's trying to make sure they don't have those feelings of, 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 uh, of self-hatred as well. And the whole irony of this is that the degree that we forgive others is the degree that they forgive themselves. And if we can total, practice total forgiveness... In fact, let's just define total forgiveness as when we forgive someone, we let it go in such a way that they can forgive themselves for what has happened. Otherwise, you're actually holding on to part of it, and otherwise, that other person's going to live for many, many years with the stigma of what has happened. And that's not what, that's not what as Jesus followers, that's not what we are about. And Joseph wants to reassure them of this, and he says, hey, you sent me here, but God did it for a reason. He's helping them to connect the dots of this, that God has a hand in all of these details as well. And he wants them to know that God has not abandoned him, and God is there with them every step of the way as well. So Joseph does that. He reduces their feelings of self-hatred. Let's look at the fourth one, the fourth one. And it says, let them save face. Just let them save that. You know, often we want people to grovel or we want people to suffer. And this is what we want. We feel like, I think, if other people will know about this, I will feel vindicated. I was right, they were wrong. And that's not what it's about. That's not what it's about at all. 
And so Joseph gives them the opportunity to, to say face by saying to them, God did this for a reason, and it was to save lives, to, to deliver us from all things. And so Joseph enables that, that feeling for them. He lets them save face on all of those things. Sometimes we don't want people to save face. We would just want them to feel as if they uh, uh, owe us something, right? And, and we are actually seeking some vengeance in it ourselves as well. But that's not what the Lord would have for us, not at all. We are to be people who freely forgive, and we are not to be those who, who, who uh, uh, want them to be marred by others, okay? Here's the fifth one. Keep the offense hidden from the person most important to them. Who is most important to them? It was their father. For 20 years, Jacob believed that his son Joseph had been killed by a wild animal like a lion. He had no idea the treachery of his brothers. So Joseph very wisely knows that this will cause great distress. So he tells him, say this to my father. And he could have said it this way. Hey, would you tell dad that you're a bunch of scumbags? Would you tell dad how you threw me into the pit? And would you tell him all the things that I screamed out of that pit? And by the way, would you tell him that I was in prison, political prison, for 10 years? Would you tell him that? And would you share all the details of my pain and misery to him? And then lastly, would you tell him that I've forgiven you for all the stupid blankety-blank things you've done to me? No, Joseph doesn't, doesn't that's not the way that he, it's not the way that he operates as well. See, here's the thing. It comes, when it comes to relationships and there's been a fracturing, we need to reinvent the relationship. Need reinvent that. Now, it doesn't mean you go back to what it was. I'm be really clear about that. There's going to be new boundaries, new things happening in this relationship, but you can reinvent the relationship. It does not mean you resume the relationship. Let me give you just a crazy idea so, about, about this and what it might look like. So let's say somebody steals a bunch of money from you, enough that you're going to notice and be miffed about it. Now then, they, there's some you know, reconciliation about that and maybe even repayment of the funds and so forth. And you can reinvent that relationship. But the new boundary is going to be, you don't get to be my bookkeeper anymore. <laughs> right? Right? There's going to be something new there, some, some new boundaries. We're reinventing what this relationship is going to look like. It happens all the time with people. You know, there's a betrayal. There's something else going on. There's some lying. Well, you're going to have some new boundaries to that. You're going to reinvent the relationship. It's going to look something different than what it was in the past. But... The goal is that you would reinvent it in some way. And Joseph does this with his brothers. And the way that he does this is to make sure the relationship with the dad is going to be, is going to be fine. He spent 17 years from the, moment, from the moment he forgives him and reveals himself. His father comes to live with him. Correct me the time I, and then 17 years later, Jacob dies. That means for 17 years, Joseph maintains forgiveness. He maintains the forgiveness of his brothers. And after his dad dies, he continues to maintain that forgiveness as well. To the day Jacob dies, and to the day that Joseph dies, he maintains that forgiveness. We struggle with that. Do you know why? Because there will be moments and times and things will flip back in your mind and you'll be thinking about the time you got wounded, you got stabbed in the back, somebody said something to you and it surfaces again 
and you begin a little bit bitter, you get a little bit vengeful. But Joseph, he maintains his forgiveness in their presence. Does anybody, I read an interesting story this week about Simon Wiesenthal. And you say, who is that? Well, he was a survivor of the Holocaust, uh, a Jewish survivor of the concentration camps in the 1940s. And Wiesenthal went on to be a Nazi hunter. And that's why he became famous, because he, would, he brought to justice many of the people who committed atrocities in the concentration camps. And many years ago, he wrote a book called The Sunflower, and he talks about some of his time in a concentration camp. And this is what happened. So he was working in a concentration camp and uh, in the medical department, and they were keeping care of the German guards, not the Jewish people. And so he was like a cleaning up person there. And one day, the nurse in charge came and got him and said, there's a German guard who's about to die and he would like to speak to a Jewish person to ask for forgiveness. So Wiesenthal tells a story and he goes in, he sits next in the bed to this German guard and the, and the German guard begins to tell him his entire story, like how he got involved with Hitler's youth army and how he became a Nazi and how he became anti-Semitic. And then he tells a story to him about how they deliberately set a building on fire that had 300 Jewish people in it. And as the Jewish people began to run out of the building, they shot them all dead with a machine gun. That's what they did. And so in this horrific place, this guard is asking for his forgiveness. And then he tells Simon Wiesenthal, he says, and I would like, like you to forgive me. And in this place that he is surrounded by death, you can, smell the con you can smell the burning ovens where they took people in their human flesh and burned them to death. And the mass graves outside. Simon Wiesenthal walks out of the room without saying a word to the German guard. The next day he dies, and the nurse person said to him, the guard has requested that you take possession of all his belongings. And Wiesenthal says, no, I don't want anything to do with him. And he says, just send those things to his mother. Well, Wiesenthal actually survives the concentration camp, and he goes and seeks out the guard's mother and has a conversation with her about the, her son. And he verifies these facts about the Nazi Youth League and all of these things. And, and she goes, well, why do you want to know? And he makes up a lie and walks off. Years later, Simon Wiesenthal writes this book and, and he asks the question, should I have forgiven the prison guard? Should I have forgiven him? And he leaves the question open-ended, and he asks for people to write in and give answers to it. And, and I think eventually 53 kind of scholars and theologians and journalists and historians, people like that, he's collected their responses. I looked through the list yesterday of those who said forgive and don't forgive. It was only like, like five people said you could forgive him. What would you do? Because you can hear the screams. You can still see it in your head. The people have been shot to death, put into ovens, gassed to death. And here's a person who helped do all of that, and he asks you to forgive him. What would you do? And you see, that for him, that was a real-life story, right? That, that's something that haunted him. 
And it just makes me think that the little things that people do to us, and we get upset with them, and we get angry with them, compared to what he went through, this is nothing. How dare we even, even remotely not forgive somebody else? After all, Jesus, the Savior of the world, the Son of God, was arrested, beaten, 26 lashes on his back, 13 across his chest, beaten into a pulp, crown of thorns, pulled out the hair of his beard, tortured him to an inch of his life, nailed him on a cross where he hung like this for six hours, and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. How can we forgive people so they can forgive themselves? Because that's what Jesus did for me for a while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Jesus forgave me, and I can forgive myself. And when you can forgive somebody else in such a way that they can forgive themselves, Jesus is going to say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you forgive us even when we did not deserve it. Help us to forgive those who have wounded us. Help us to forgive those who betrayed us. Help us to forgive those who have hurt our feelings. And we pray that we can be people who are just like your son Jesus. And in our hearts we can change and we can say, Father, forgive them. So that they can forgive themselves. And we pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.